parallelism with array languages. I'm now going to do a few um, videos on purely computer science issues because I got requests to do that um, in response to some incidental material on computer science in previous videos. So I'm going to talk about the motivation for the development of array languages in the context of current microprocessors. I'm going to be looking at how hardware parallelism evolved. I'm going, over the course of the whole set of videos, I'm going to argue for the conceptual advantages of whole array programming. I will look at the constructs and idioms used in such programming. I'll give examples of how you can get gains of performance. And for those who are interested in the nitty gritty of it, I will look at how one translates these high level language constructs into efficient machine code. I'm going to be focusing on the language vector Pascal, which was an extension of Pascal that allows whole array operations. And it vectorizes these and parallelizes them across multiple CPUs. It was developed specifically to take advantage of the SIMD instruction sets of modern processors while, meaning back, while keeping backward compatibility with legacy Pascal code. It stands in a similar relationship to ISO Pascal as Fortran 95 stands to Fortran 77. And it's heavily influenced by other array languages like J, APL and ZPL. It aims to be a complete programming language. It's a superset of ISO Pascal and it systematically extends all operations to data parallel form. And then it automatically parallelizes them automatically at compile time and at runtime. When I say it's a superset of ISO Pascal, I've run comparative tests on the ISO conformance tests uh, suite between Vector Pascal and other leading Pascal compilers still in circulation, and it uh, meets these conformance tests better. It was originally developed back in the 80s. The first Vector Pascal compilers came out in the 80s, and you can only understand that in the context of the evolution of machine architecture during the 1980s. Typical machines available at the time for most people, or for most computing labs, were things like the VAX 11, which was a 32-bit so-called mini-computer, though pretty large by modern standards. This was a, a mini-computer because it was somewhat smaller than the equivalent IBM mainframe computers of the 360 or 370 series, which are again 32-bit machines. Alongside these, a very small number of computer centers had what were called supercomputers, predominantly made by the Cray Company. Cray had been the chief designer of Control Data Corporation, and then he moved off to form his own supercomputer company. And these were typically 64-bit machines and significantly faster than IBM mainframes, but they were very expensive. His machines had eight vector registers, whereas other computers had registers that would hold a single number. Each of these vector registers could hold 64 floating point numbers. And there were load and store instructions which could load the entire register, the entire 64 words into one of these big registers. And there were single instructions that would do plus minus multiply between two vector registers. They didn't have divide, they had a, an instruction that, that would compute the reciprocal of a a vector register, which 
if you combine that with a multiply, gave you the same effect as divide. On vector calculations, benchmarks from the 1980s indicate that Cray could be up to 10 times faster than an IBM mainframe on some highly vectorizable jobs. Other jobs, it was only two and a half times as fast. Now, the first implementation of Vector Pascal dates from the 80s, as I said. It's by a guy called Turner, who did it in his PhD thesis in 87. And it was part of the move at the time to develop languages suitable for supercomputers. The most obvious e example, which I mentioned earlier, was the way Fortran was being extended from Fortran 77, which was optimized for scalar machines like IBM mainframes, to Fortran 90 and Fortran 95, which ran on supercomputers like those produced by Cray. Now, if you look deeper into the intellectual history of it, though, the thing that people who produce Fortran 90 and Vector Pascal were working from were the interpretive language or APL, which was widely used um, in the, the 60s and 70s. It had originally been introduced in 1962 by IBM and was supported on their mainframes, but also the first IBM PCs, um, the 5100 and 5110 um, from 75 and 78 ran APL. Now, if you look at this picture of a 5110, you see the keyboard has a lot of odd symbols on it, and these are APL mathematical symbols which you could also get on the standard um, mechanical typewriters scale electric typewriters that were used as input to IBM mainframes so what were the great ideas that people were borrowing from this language APL well one of them was that vectors and matrices should be first class objects and that vector and matrix arithmetic should be built in. Now, clearly that's very useful for a lot of scientific processing. The other area where APL was widely used was in finance, and some of the last companies to go on producing um, APL subsystems or systems were big banks. Um, Morgan Stanley had its own version of this. Another great advantage of it was it gave a very concise mathematical notation. Iverson had been a mathematician and his aim was to take maths notation and convert it into a linear form without superscripts and subscripts which would enable it to be used on the computer as concisely as a mathematical expression that a mathematician was used to. Another great feature of it, certainly for people working in banking, etc., was that it was interactive. Um, you didn't have to compile. And, and this is one of the things which has had a lasting impact. It introduced for the first time in programming the use of functionals. That is to say, functions which take operators and give new functions. And uh, the ones he introduced, for example, were map, scan, and reduce. And these are widely used now in functional programming. The not so great features was that, as I said, it requires a special keyboard. There's a photo of my machine with the keyboard on it. And if you zoom in, you see the special features. I could only get them by ordering stick-ons to put onto a standard keyboard. The other thing is the math symbols are unfamiliar uh, and they make for a steep learning curve for new users. The strong feature of it being interpretive and dynamic 
means that the types of identifiers, the types of a variable, change as the program runs. And this makes it very hard to compile and because it's not compiled it tends to be considerably slower than compiled code. Now computer evolution moves in a great wheel. The same things happen repeatedly. So the first cycle was going from mainframes to Cray-like supercomputers. The next cycle moved from mini computers. I'm showing an 11, 7, 1140 there, a deck machine, to attached array processors, which were mini computers with some vector processing facilities. And this was the the original target machine of Vector Pascal that Turner had access to. The Great Wheel goes on and many computers were shrunk down to microprocessors so you have an 8086 here on the left which was somewhat above the capacity of an 1140 and on the right you have a P4 Pentium which for the first time incorporates vector processing of floating point numbers. So ideas which occurred in mainframes, recapitulated mini computers, recapitulated de decade or two afterwards in microprocessors. Now let's look at the astonishing improvement in throughput that Intel have been able to achieve over the period of some 50 years that they've been producing microprocessors. They start off with a 4-bit microprocessor running at 100 kilohertz clock. Now if you multiply the clock by the number of bits that can be processed in a single operation, you get the number of million bits per second that the processor can handle. And this little calculator chip, the 4004, could handle 0 0.4 million bits per second. It's still, when you put it like that, it's still an impressive amount of data. They then, three years later, had an 8-bit microprocessor and they'd sped the clock up 20 times and they're already now dealing with 16 million bits per second. By 1978, they had the 8086, which would provide the basis for the first PCs. That took it up to 80 bits per second. They'd up the clock speed and doubled the register size. A well, just under a decade later, they doubled the register size again to 32 bits and I reckon that that machine had 512 million bits per second throughput. They then went to the first of their vector, semi-vectorized machines, the MMX Pentium, which had 64-bit vector registers, and I'm not going to read out these numbers. They're, they're, they're getting too big to easily uh, read out. As you go through time, the number of bits in the registers goes up, went from four, and the latest machines like Tiger Lake and Sapphire Rapids have 512 bits. The clock speed goes up and up, except Sapphire Rapids, because it has a lot more cores, has the a somewhat slower clock speed than a, a Tiger Lake. The experiment, the demos, demos I give will be on a Tiger Lake. Number of cores stays at one until around 2011, and then it starts to grow rapidly. Uh, Sapphire Rapids has, has 56, 60, 64, depends how many they enable. So huge improvement in parallelism, in terms of bit parallelism. I'm not talking about numbers of... Um, cores, 
because if you go right back to the early days of microcomputers, some of the, the ones being sold were one bit parallel. They might deal with 16 bit words, but they dealt with them one bit at a time. Now, taking that data and graphing it, you can see the upper line is the, the line of throughput growth, and that's a constant exponential growth rate, since it's a log log graph. On the other hand, the clock speed trend levels off. I've had other videos explaining why clock speeds level off and why improvements in performance have to come from wider data registers and use of more cores. Now, I've mentioned before SIMD parallelism. This was the first form of parallelism introduced in the Pentium and was single instruction, multiple data. One opcode could operate on a vector of values. And this is the main reason why register lengths have risen since the, the 386. The rise in register lengths, for instance, from the 386 to the Pentium MX was not due to a wider address space, it was due to introducing vector registers which could operate on more values. Multi-core parallelism, which I say has been significant since for about uh, 15 years maybe, involves multiple streams of data going through different uh, processes. And these two types of parallelism cause quite different problems for compiler writers. The driving force behind all this has been graphics and you can see four stages in the evolution of this. Firstly, Intel with the MMX Pentium introduced saturated parallel arithmetic. I'll, work, I'll talk about this a bit more, working on pixel arrays. Then in order to do well on games which involve transformations of three-dimensional coordinates by multiplying them by a transformation matrix um, which you need for 3D games. They needed to work with floating point vectors. So AMD were first with this and they brought out something called 3D Now, I think it was called. And Intel rapidly followed on the P4 processor where they had the floating point um, vector registers as well. They, Intel only had shorter vector, re sorry, AMD had short vector registers. Intel had longer ones and AMD then moved over to the Intel standard. If you look on ARM chips, the NEON instruction set is similar to this. Next you start getting NVIDIA and AMD producing multi-core GPUs. Again targeted at gaming and graphics operations which are able to operate again on 32-bit floats, again for transformations of coordinates in order to adapt a given set of objective positions to changes in views. Sony and Intel then responded to this by developing multi-core CPUs optimized for 32-bit graphics. Um, the cell processor which was used in the PlayStation 3 is an example of this. Intel produced a prototype GPU called the Larabee and then marketed it as the Xeon Phi which um, had I think the one I developed my, the compiler on was a 56 core version. Um, they now have taken the instruction set of that Xeon Phi and with slight mods included it in the Sapphire Rapids Xeon range which have a similar number of cores but the, the cores in the Sapphire Rapids are much faster than the cores in the um, 
Xeon Phi, which basically had P4 processors. These original graphics features have now been made use of and provide the technological foundations for AI and scientific data processing. Things which were originally developed for computer games have become the basis for AI. Now I'm going to go back to the first stage of um, this parallelization because the current compiler that I'm talking about, the one developed at Glasgow University, we developed it around 2000 to make use of the um, MMX instruction set. It was developed in the Turing Institute which was working on computer vision and needed to process images fast. And when we were operating with 8-bit pit cells, one had the problem that arithmetic operations can wrap round. Suppose you want to add two images. You can add two bright pixels and the result will be more than 256. And because of wraparound, this results in a dark pixel. So one has to put in software guards around this. Now let's look at what you would have to do for C code. Suppose I'm, I'm wanting to add two ve vectors of pixels, um, V1 and V2. I add them together and put the result in an integer temporary t. And I then have to check if that temporary is greater than 255. If it is, I set it to 255 to prevent the wraparound before I assign it to the final vector. So what should be one operation gets split into three instructions or three not three instructions but three operations in the high level language code now let me see if i can demonstrate running this program um hold on a moment i can find the mouse okay let's compile sat misspelt it, never mind. I will time it. Time. So that took just over a second. Uh, remember the timing. I'm going to go back to um, the video slides now. If I want to do the same thing in Vector Pascal, I just express it. Well, first I declare three arrays of bytes, same way as before. I've said the type byte is the numeric range 0 to 255. But the key line is I just add the two vectors together. I don't have to loop round because the language understands adding whole vectors and it understands saturated arithmetic by using the plus colon sign which says add the two numbers together check if they are up to 255 if they are saturate them and return 255 now if we demo this Well, this took, you can see, at least five, it's at least five times faster. Oops. 
Why is it five times faster? And what machine am I running it on? Well, it's actually an unbranded Chinese motherboard with, oh sorry, it's a branded Chinese motherboard using an unlabeled chip, which turns out this is inaccurately called a Pentium M. It's actually a Tiger Lake running at three gig, three, 0.1 gigahertz. I chose this um, rather obscure motherboard because after the Tiger Lake series, Intel dropped their AVX5112 instruction set, so I wouldn't be able to demonstrate or develop the AVX5112 instruction set on, on later machines. Why is it faster? Well, the Pascal code is compiled to use MMX vector instructions which make use of the built-in capacity of the MMX to do saturated arithmetic. So it doesn't actually have to have a test and branch in there so the pipeline isn't interrupted. Uh, some caution on this. I, when I first did this test some 20 years ago I got that the Pascal compiler was more than 40, 20 times faster than GCC. The GCC compiler has become a lot fast, a lot better since then. In later videos, I'm going to talk about language extensions for arrays and matrices, extensions to type systems, support for operator definition, lexical extensions to allow mathematical symbols in the language, um, literate programming to allow LaTeX in the language, how you write polymorphic libraries, and how multi-core parallelism is implemented and used.